On August 25th, 2017, the Half-Life community woke up to the biggest news of the last decade. The story of Episode 3 has just been published by Mark Laidlaw, the main writer of the Half-Life series. But what exactly led up to that moment? What were the contents of the story and how did the community react? Today, I'm here to tell you a story of Episto 3. Taking a look at the Half-Life community at the time, the situation was pretty bleak overall. With 2007 marking the release of the last game in the franchise, it was only modding that kept the scene alive, and even that scene took a major hit with the release of the Steam Pipe update in 2013, which changed how mods had to be structured, thus breaking a ton of previous mods so that they need manual fixing by the user. Half-Life 2 update released? Which was a short glimpse of light in what was a dying community. Said updated version did not prove to be as stable as expected and was relatively quickly forgotten about again. Thankfully, there were sites like Run Think Should Live that hosted constant mapping contests that somewhat kept things together. But not gonna lie, things did look grim. Valve is notoriously tight-lipped about the games and there had been no news about Half-Life 3 or Episode 3 at all, besides the occasional one line of code one might call a leak. Rumors about Episode 3 being fully cancelled were cruising around the community and seemingly confirmed by Mark Laidlaw. For anyone that isn't aware, Mark Laidlaw is the main writer of the series and wrote the story for Half-Life 1 all the way up to Half-Life 2 Episode 2. Besides that, he also released quite a few books and makes music these days. How did he confirm that Episode 3 was cancelled? Well, he only kinda did. By confirming he has no idea about the status of the game, he did so in an interview he gave in July 2017 on Arcade Attack, in which he answered quite a few questions regarding his career. The one of note for today though is the question, do you have any idea whether Half-Life 3 will ever be released and would you be willing to work on this title? To note, at this point he had already left Valve and was in retirement. His response was, no idea and I have no interest in going back. I had ideas for Episode 3. They were all supposed to take the series to a point where I could step away from it and leave it to the next generation. I had hoped for a reset between Half-Life 2 and Half-Life 3 that was as dramatic as the shift between Half-Life 1 and Half-Life 2. I honestly don't know if anyone else shared this goal, but it seemed important to me to give ultimate freedom to whoever inherited the series, with my own personal set of loose ends tied up to my satisfaction. Unfortunately, I was not able to do that, but I never thought as far ahead as Half-Life 3, unless you were to say that it and Episode 3 were the same thing. I would say that I expected every installment would end without resolution, forever and ever. There was some rumor going around that Episode 3 or Half-Life 3 would end Gordon Freeman's story, and I don't think that was accurate. My intention was that Episode 3 would tie up the plot threads that were particular to Half-Life 2, but it would still end like Half-Life 1 and Half-Life 2, with Gordon in an indeterminate space, on hold, waiting for the next game to begin, so one cliffhanger after another. While especially the first sentence was not surprising and definitely an understandable decision by Mark Laidler, it did leave the community kind of shocked and it didn't help the bleak state it was in already anyway. Seriously, you should have been there. Everyone was miserable. It was interesting though to learn about the concept of Episode 3 being planned to be a reset of sorts, making space for a new story like Half-Life 1 did for Half-Life 2. We now arrive at the fateful day. At 2.05am on the 25th of August 2017, Mark Laidler published an article on his blog with the title Episode 3. This article consisted of a story that fans very quickly put together to be the script for an episode 3 would it have been developed. And very important to note as per Mark Laidlaw's words, episode 3, not Half-Life 3. The characters we know and love had their names changed in this story, be it Gordon Freeman being called Gertie Furmont or Alex Vance being called Alex Vaunt. It's also written in a way where it's supposed to be Gordon Freeman himself writing a letter addressed to the player, in which he tells the events that transpired. I'm not gonna read you the whole story, as I feel I would be stealing the work of Mark Lather. I will sometimes take snippets of his sentences though, especially when he's describing something in detail like the Borealis. Overall, I'm gonna summarize it in a way where I don't leave out any details. There seems to be a deeper meaning in the whole Gordon Freeman writing this thing, which is why I'm gonna leave out the introduction and outro of this letter and just jump right into the story for now. A lot of the art I will be showing throughout this video was submitted by members of my Discord in a small Epista 3 art competition I hosted there. Make sure to join the Discord as well if you haven't yet. The link is in the description. Alright, let's get into the story of Epistle 3. After Eli's death, the Resistance was traumatized. They were doubting if it made any sense to go on at all. After Eli was buried, they did manage to regroup. It was Alex Vance who wanted to continue for her father. The Resistance was split. Eli wanted the Borealis destroyed so that it would not get into the hands of the Combine. There were others that believed it holds a big secret that would lead to the revolution's success. With the Arctic coordinates included in Mosman's transmission, which were believed to be those of the Borealis, Alex and Gordon boarded a helicopter to set off to the Arctic. A much larger support team, mainly militia, was to follow by other modes of transport. The helicopter was brought down by something, which Gordon Freeman struggled to remember in this letter. After moving through the Arctic wastelands for multiple hours, 
they approached the coordinates that Dr. Mossman gave them. They expected to find the Borealis. What they saw though was a complex fortified installation, combine technology, which was surrounded by large open fields of ice. There was no sign of the Borealis, not at first at least. After stealthily infiltrating the common installation, there was a recurrent, strangely coherent auroral effect as of a vast hologram fading in and out of view. First believed to be some kind of phenomenon caused by common technology, Alex and Gordon soon realized that this was in fact the Borealis itself. It was phasing in and out of existence and the common were studying it each time it did appear. Mossman had not provided coordinates for its exact location, but only a prediction as to where it would arrive. The vessel was oscillating in and out of reality. Its pulses were gradually steadying, but there was no guarantee it would settle into any place for long or at all. Alex and Gordon determined that they would need to board the ship as soon as it became physical. It was then that they were both caught by the Combine. It turns out though that this wasn't actually the Combine themselves, but only minions of their former nemesis, Breen. Dr. Breen was not what he was last seen as. The Combine had saved an earlier version of his consciousness and implanted it into a being that looks like a giant slug, the Breen Grub. Breen seemed frightened of Gordon. Breen did not know his previous self had died. He only knew that it was Freeman who was responsible. Breen confessed that even in his position of some power, he was still a prisoner of the Combine. He had no joy in living in his grotesque existence and begged for his life to be ended. Alex believed that this would be too quick of a death for Breen. Gordon, however, felt the need to hasten Breen's death once Alex was out of sight. Shortly after this, they encountered Mossman being held in a common interrogation cell. Things between Judith and Alex were pretty tense. Alex blamed Mossman for her father's death, which she was not even aware of up until this point. Alex was a lot more furious at Mossman than Gordon was, understandably so, though they did depend on her. She possessed resonance keys that are needed to fully bring the Borealis into our plane of existence. The Borealis was brought into brief coherence. In this time, they scrambled aboard the ship, with many combined agents close behind. Once on board, the ship's oscillations resume. It was too late for the Resistance military support, which arrived and joined the combined forces in battle just as Gordon, Alex and Mosman rebounded between universes. On the way to the control room of the ship, the ship's history proved non-linear. Years before, during the combined invasion, various members of an earlier science team, working in the hull of a dry lock vessel situated at the Aperture Science Research Facility in Michigan, the scientists figured out instantaneous teleportation using a bootstrap device. The bootstrap device would create a field around whatever object it was given. This field could then teleport to any chosen destination without the need for any portals. It was never tested though. Once the command arrived on Earth, they seized control of the most important research facilities. The staff of the Borealis teleported the ship to the furthest away location possible in an attempt to keep it out of Combine's hands, Arctica. What they did not realize though is that the bootstrap device traveled in both space and time nor was it limited to one time or one location. Once the device was activated, the Borealis got stretched across space and time between the Seven Hour War and the present day Arctic. It was pulled taut as an elastic band, vibrating. Except where at certain points some could find still spots, like the harmonic spots along a vibrating guitar string. One of these harmonics was where Gordon and Alex bought it. But the string ran forward and back in both space and time. Soon they were pulled in every direction themselves. Looking from the bridge, this anomaly caused them to see the dry docks of Aperture Science at the moment of teleportation, just as the combined forces closed in. At the same time they could see the arctic wastelands where the resistance were fighting to make their way to the Borealis. They also saw completely other worlds, somewhere in the future perhaps, or maybe the past. Alex grew convinced that this would be one of the combine's central staging areas for invading other worlds such as our own. Fighting throughout the ship, they were unsure what to do. Should they run the Borealis into the ground in the arctic, giving the peers a chance to study it? Should it be destroyed with them on board? The visuals they were seeing made it hard to think. Once it came down to it, most men argued reasonably that they should deliver the Borealis to the Resistance. That their greatest minds could study it and use it. Alex however swore to destroy the ship. She hatched a plan in which she would set the Borealis to self-destruct and ride it into the heart of the Combine's invasion nexus. An argument broke out between Mossman and Alex. Mossman overpowered Alex and prepared to settle the ship on the ice, to which a gunshot was fired. Please. Enough of your bullshit! Judith fell to the ground. Alex decided for the entire resistance at that moment. With Mossman dead, Alex armed the Borealis and created a time-traveling missile, steering it right into the heart of the Combine's command center. At this point, the G-Man appeared. Not for Gordon, however, but for Alex instead. Alex recognized him, even though she last saw him in her childhood. The G-Man said, Come along with me now. We have places to be and things to do. She followed him out of the Borealis, out of our reality. The door was not held open for Gordon. The G-Man only shortly looking at him and smirking. There was no way out. Gordon caught a glimpse of the Dyson Sphere that was the Combine world. 
the vastness of the Combine made Gordon realize that even the Borealis, the most powerful weapon, would register as less than a fizzling match head as it blew itself apart. What remained of Gordon would be even less than that. Just then, the Vortigons came in through their own curtains of reality and plucked them out of there before the explosion happened. That is the ending. Now, as I've mentioned, I left out the intro and outro. I will get into why I did so now. These two blocks of text serve as an explanation as for one, why Gordon was writing this letter, and two, how the situation was back on Earth after he got placed there by the Vortigons. Now, what readers quickly gathered, and also becomes blatantly obvious, is that these are not meant to be Gordon's thoughts. While they could be interpreted so, these are actually thoughts of Mark Laidler about his time at Valve. Let's read these texts with that in mind. Let's start with the intro. Dearest player, I hope the setter finds you well. I can hear your complaints already. Gordon Freeman, we have not heard from you in ages. Well, if you care to hear excuses, I have plenty. The greatest of them being, I've been in other dimensions and whatnot, unable to reach you by the usual means. This was the case until 18 months ago, where I experienced a critical change in my circumstances and was redeposited on these shores. In the time since, I have been able to think occasionally about how best to describe the intervening years, my years of silence. I do first apologize for the wait. And that done, I hasten to finally explain, albeit briefly, quickly and in very little detail, events following that described in my previous letter, referred to with as episode 2. When Mark Leitler, or I guess Gordon Freeman, says 18 months ago, he is referring to January of 2016, the same month Mark Leitler left Valve. Mark Laidler is apologizing for being so silent on the whole topic and is now on the shores that are not working at Valve, possibly also a metaphor for now being at a way more peaceful place. Since Valve is not known for having the best work environment, now for the outro. And here we are, I spoke of my return to this shore. It has been a circuitous path to lands I once knew, and surprising to see how much the terrain has changed. Enough time has passed that few remember me, or what I was saying when last I spoke, or what precisely we hoped to accomplish. At this point, the resistance will have failed or succeeded, no thanks to me. Old friends have been silenced or fallen by the wayside. I no longer know or recognize most members of the research team, though I believe the spirit of the rebellion still persists. I expect you to know better than I the appropriate course of action, and I'll leave you to it. Expect no further correspondence from me regarding these matters. This is my final episode. Yours in infinite finality, Gordon Freeman, PhD. This is simply referring to Mark Laidler looking at Valve now. The terrain has changed, referring to Valve. Nobody remembers him, nobody knows what he was saying when he last spoke or what precisely they hoped to accomplish. He has no further impact on the team, which is what he's referring to when saying, at this point, the resistance will have failed or succeeded, no thanks to me. Old friends have been silenced or fallen by the wayside. I no longer know or recognize most members of the research team. Simply take research out of the sentence to get its actual meaning. I expect you, referring to the team at Valve, know better than I the appropriate cause of action, and I leave you to it. Expect no further correspondence from me regarding these matters. This is my final episode. No translating needed here. He has said all that needs to be said and wants to leave it off at that. He has found his piece. Could this outro also perfectly fit for Gordon? Of course. It's a brilliant piece of writing that never fails to give me chills. I'm not gonna fully get into the fallout of this letter just yet. But I will tell you what Mark Laidler later added. For one, he had a couple alternate endings through his Twitter. He offered the idea of Mossman being pushed into a portal, leaving her fate unknown. He also asked if perhaps there is space for Barney or Dog, but didn't offer anything himself. He also seemed interested in how the story would be told. Perhaps have the player start on the Borealis and have physical time loops function as flashbacks. Or have the player start with glimpses of a common interrogation cell, hinting that the entire experience has provoked fantasy as a means of getting information. I wonder where he got that idea from. Or would it just be a straightforward linear experience? For the most interesting alternate ending, he offered that there could be a final explosion that powers a time loop singularity that puts Gordon back on the Black Mesa inbound train, right before the test is about to take place. Did it all never happen? Or is it about to happen again? He left the question open. Mark later removed the Epistle 3 story a total of 5 years and 9 months later in May 2022, and he regrets ever publishing it. In an interview with Rock Paper Shotgun, he says that he was spending time alone on an island and had nobody there to stop him. Would he have just calmed down his mind, he would have come out the other side a lot less embarrassed. He further adds that it caused a lot of trouble for his friends and made their lives harder. It also created the impression that if there had been an episode 3, it would have been anything like his outline. Whereas in fact, all the real story development can only happen in the crucible of developing the game. So what people got wasn't episode 3 at all. It was a snapshot of where he was in his mind at that time. He further adds that he was deranged, that there's really no other explanation than that. Which, it is very important to state that episode 3 will most likely not look like this. Sure, good chance of it being similar, 
but it won't be Pistol 3. I would still like to get into a bit of story discussion about it though. The Borealis is obviously the very most interesting aspect of all this. We finally got a glimpse of what it was planned to be. A space and time shifting object. I love this idea a ton. Especially being able to see tearing visions of the past and the future. Showing us the Aperture Science Labs and time where it was still active. And the 7 hour war, both at once. How incredibly cool would that be? The Breen Grub is another interesting aspect. It was widely speculated that Breen was uploaded into another body. Previously thought to be an advisor, specifically this, this and this advisor. At least I thought so. Most of this coming from the fact that this advisor seemed to still be learning how it controls its body. I guess to be fair, the Breen Grub could have been an advisor at one point. Given that advisors seem to wear some kind of armor. Who knows what they actually look like under that. Another interesting thing is the G-Man saving Alex and not Gordon. We saw this tension growing after Half-Life 2. Gordon was released from stasis with the assistance of the Vortigons, which the G-Man did not appreciate. In Episode 2 he only rarely appeared and was definitely more interested in Alex than in Gordon. Half-Life Alex spoilers ahead, you know the drill? Skip to this timestamp if you don't want to hear them. Alright, here we go. As anyone who has played Half-Life Alex will know, Epistle 3 is not possible after the release of Alex. Possibly done just for the sake of retconning any possibility of Epistle 3 being a thing. They for one revived Eli and took away Alex at the time they were supposed to fly to the Borealis. Now how that makes sense is still left open, as time travel is way too complicated for me to figure out. But it also doesn't matter for now. While we're on the topic of Half-Life Alex, I also wanted to mention that the game furthermore proved how incredibly important Alex seems to be in the eyes of the G-Man. Far more than Gordon or any character of any game. I do hope we still get a sequel in this century, as I need to see at least some questions answered for the love of God. I find it interesting though how large Epistle 3 was, given that Half of Alex was considered a retcon, even though Epistle 3 is not official. And no, reviving Eli through time travel is not a retcon, at least not the same as what a usual retcon is. A retcon is going back and overwriting something you wrote previously in a sequel or prequel. Time traveling and changing something in lore is not a retcon. Can you call it a retcon for all intents and purposes? Sure. But be aware that there is a difference in in-law retcon and an actual retcon. I wonder if the release of any future sequels will have us feel like it's a retcon to Entropy Zero 2, which many just consider the head canon as of late. Alright, we're now leaving Alex spoilers. Let's get into community reactions. Now, while it might have kinda made it sound like this would be a good thing for the community, in a way it was just a send-off or a final nail in the coffin. Going back to old forum posts or YouTube comments on videos announcing it, people were saying goodbye to the franchise. It did kinda feel like the end times. What more is there to come? The thing we were fruitlessly waiting for finally spoiled for us. What was a moment of excitement quickly turned into mourning the franchise we loved. Now this is all just the immediate reaction. It didn't take long for it to kinda bounce back. Once people accepted this to be nothing more than Laidlaw sharing his idea. He also further stated back then that it was merely a fanfiction. Which kinda sounds fitting. I don't think anyone was mad at Mark Laidlaw for this. If anything, they were grateful for at least getting some kind of ending. I mean, how many people have died between 2007 and 2017 that were waiting for a conclusion to their favorite story? At least Epistle 3 is a kind of semi-official ending brought to you by someone who has authority in the matter. You can now die kinda happy with Epistle 3. I'm probably the only one that has brought death into this discussion, but that's just how my brain works. There were also quite a few projects that sprung up during that time that were aiming to recreate Epistle 3 as its own game slash mod. Some of the gameplay seen in the background of this video is just that. I think that topic warrants a video of its own though. Which let me know if you want to see that. A video where I take a look at community Half-Life 3 projects. Also, only two days later did the Episode 3 beta leaks release. Which you can check out my video on that as well. Be wary though, I talk fast as hell in that video for some reason. Just put it on 0.75. In conclusion, Episode 3 is a very beautiful piece of art, both giving the community the answers they were desperately waiting for and letting Mark Laidlaw speak about his time at Valve and how he feels the work environment at Valve has changed. Community-wise, Epistle 3 was but a short spark of hope in a pretty much dying Half-Life community, after which it quickly accelerated its demise, but only for a short while. It left many fans happy in the long run. They finally at least had an answer, even if said by Mark Leder himself to not be official and not what Episode 3 will end up looking like. Not leaving on too bad of a note, I think that since the release of Half-Life Alex and mods like Entropy Zero 2, the Half-Life community has had a major resurgence and is doing better than ever, basically. And of course not just Entropy Zero 2. There are a ton of great mods that have released over the past couple of years that are all helping to keep the Half-Life community alive. I can't overstate enough how grateful I am for the modding community. It's so incredible to see. This is the entirety of the story of Epistle 3. I hope you enjoyed. Huge shout out to everyone that has submitted something for the Epistle 3 art challenge. You guys are legends and I'll be sure to do another art competition soon. Don't forget to join the Discord if you want to take part in future competitions. 
or if you just want to hang out. Also consider becoming a channel member for many new bonuses and perks, including a special chat room in the Discord in which I respond more frequently. So yeah, otherwise, thank you for watching. What? No, no, alright, I know that sounds bad. <laughs>